I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here. This is the China History Podcast. I hope you boarded the right flight. More Taiwan history, believe it or not. Part four today. Last episode, we saw how since the annexation of Taiwan into the Qing Empire in 1684, things had not gone all too smoothly. Emperors Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong Well, Taiwan wasn't their top priority. Where Taiwan policy was concerned, the Qing rulers, starting with Kangxi, only had three red lines. They didn't want any foreigners doing anything on Taiwan except dropping off or picking up cargo. No building forts or settlements of any kind. They also didn't want any Qing separatists using Taiwan as a base for any anti-Qing operations a la Zheng Changgong in the 1660s. And worst of all, they didn't want anyone using Taiwan as a base from which to plan anything that rhymed with or sounded like restoring the Ming. Everything else beyond those three red lines, they left up to the provincial and local authorities to decide. And as we saw last episode, many of these officials on Taiwan viewed the waves of Chinese settlers from the mainland as ready meat to be exploited through heavy taxation, land confiscation, arbitrary fees and licenses. Some officials were worse than others. The number of rebellions and uprisings that broke out during the Qing rule of Taiwan attests to their misrule. When the poor old Jia Qing Emperor finally got to begin his reign following the death of his father, the Qianlong Emperor, in 1799, the population of Taiwan was hovering around 2 million people, with most of that number comprised of settlers who had arrived since the time of the Zheng's Dongning Kingdom. Following the Opium Wars, Four ports opened up on Taiwan at Anping, present-day Tainan, Kaohsiung, Jilong, and Danshui. And all those Chinese who left the mainland to farm or start a business on Taiwan, mostly men in the beginning, as mentioned last episode, they all came from just a few locations. It was just like the United States during the gold rush and railroad years, 1850s and 1860s. Almost every Chinese you might run into came from any one of five counties all right next to one another in the Pearl River Delta region. In Taiwan, the Fujianese comprised the greatest majority by far. These Hokkien or Hoklo came from either the Changzhou Xiamen area or from the next major city over, Quanzhou. The Hakas, well, they were in the minority, but there were still a lot of them. And they came from, eh, where else? Meixian, easternmost Guangdong province, Mei County. Even today, the approximately 73% Fujianese and 13% Hakas in Taiwan, they probably trace their ancestry to any one of those cities I just mentioned. The Chaozhou people who lived on the Guangdong coast, a hop, skip, and a jump south of the Hakas, well, as you could see so far, the Diojus, well, we haven't heard much of them. Taiwan wasn't their destination of choice. They mostly went in the other direction, to Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, and other Southeast Asian destinations. And all these Chinese migrants, including the real trailblazers who came to Penghu in Taiwan during the Song and Ming, today, well, since 1949 at least, they're called the Bansheng-ren, the people of this province, meaning Taiwan. In 1949, Taiwan's going to see an invasion the likes of which it had never seen before. And all these people who flee the mainland are called Waishengren, not of this province. They came from somewhere else. They're not originally from Taiwan. Last episode I mentioned, thanks in part to the Qing policy of using Hakkas in particular as their 
Revolutionary Guard, so to speak, it created a lot of friction between the Hakas and Fujianese. And both of these linguistic groups had their own difficulties with the native people. And this triangle of hate kept things far from peaceful on Taiwan. Even between the Fujianese from Zhangzhou and the next town north, Quanzhou, oh, going back to the Lin Shuangwen Rebellion, 1787 to 88, well, clans from these two groups feuded constantly. As for the people whose ancestors lived on Taiwan for thousands of years, going back to even before the Great Pacific Migration, eh, theirs is a sad tale to tell. The tribes along the West Coast and up and down the plains, they were the first ones to be forced to sink or swim in the new order. As I mentioned last time, in the eastern two-thirds of Taiwan, there were steep mountains inhabited by Kaushan people. It's a blanket term for all the mountain aboriginal people. Official Qing policy was to leave them alone, give them a wide berth, and not to create unrest by encroaching on their tribal lands. And ever since the arrival of the Dutch and Spanish in the 1620s, the indigenous tribes closest to the colonial centers in Tainan and Jilong saw their world and way of life change forever. For the people in the mountains, their time would come later. And as of 1839, the official Qing policy still prohibited settlers from encroaching on native lands. All along the Qing court tried to strictly limit the number of Fujianese emigrating to Taiwan. The frequency of the local uprisings and the stories of the violence meted out by native people did nothing to slow down the numbers of people coming to Taiwan legally or illegally. And no small number of aboriginals felt, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And many saw a bright future for themselves, assimilating and shedding their millennia-old identity for a new one. As far as the Chinese mainland and European visitors to the island are concerned, Taiwan's history began in the south, and by the early 1800s, almost three-quarters of the population had settled there. But into the 19th century, things began to balance out as the northern half of the island slowly filled up, especially in the northeast. Taiwan, as we saw, suffered plenty of unrest during the 1700s. The 19th century was no better. We all know the history of the long lead-up to the Opium War that started in 1839 and culminated in the Treaty of Nanjing, 1842, and Convention of Beijing in 1860. During the Opium War, the East India Company had been sizing up Taiwan as a possible Hong Kong, so to speak, a strategic seaport location from which to base their commercial operations in the South China Sea and engage in the profitable China trade. Taiwan was one of the many possible locations being considered, and one of the great men of the day had written Lord Palmerston back in London claiming, if given permission, based on what he knew to be true, with enough ammo, he could take the place in a day. There were a couple major incidents that occurred on the Taiwan coast that were related to the Opium War. This account comes from the Chinese Repository, Volume 9, from January to December, 1842. It all began with this transport ship making a Hong Kong Joshan run. The vessel was named the Nurbuda, after India's fifth longest river. This vessel had the misfortune of being blown off course and ended up stranded in Jilong Bay with a broken mast. They were met by hostile natives. Many were killed. And it was a wholly unpleasant situation. 243 of the crew were Indians, plus 24 Europeans. These were all merchant seamen. They didn't carry weapons. They were non-combatants. Stranded in the bay, they decided to make a desperate run for help. The Europeans hopped in a rowboat and managed to get away and were later picked up and taken to Hong Kong where they alerted their superiors. The remaining 150 or so who didn't die or get summarily executed were marched down to the capital and imprisoned. 
Then a few months later, in March 1842, another ship got blown off course, sailing from Zhoushan to Macau, and right off the shoreline of the Da'an district of Taichung, the crew of the Ann found themselves in similar circumstances as their fellow seamen from the New Buddha. 34 Indians, 14 Europeans, 5 Chinese. Again, all worker bees who didn't carry guns. All they did was move cargo. The unscrupulous officials, the Manchu boss and his Chinese counterpart who were in charge of this matter, well, they reported to Beijing that these vessels, the Nerbuda and the An, were captured in battle following a brilliant military victory. It was reported that these foreign vessels had fired upon Chinese naval vessels, and they were defeated and captured and currently incarcerated. The officials completely misrepresented the actual events, but they figured uh, opportunities like this didn't come too often, and the situation should be milked for all it's worth. Well, come August, following a defeat at the hands of the British at the Battle of Ningbo, so outraged was the Daoguang Emperor at this loss, trying to take back the city from the British, when asked about what should be done with these prisoners being held in Taiwan, he said, kill them all and all but eight were duly executed. They were all decapitated. And somehow this whole matter regarding the perfidy of the officials and the brutality in which the prisoners were treated during their confinement and the manner in which they were executed, it all got out. And the officials, well, they only got their wrists slapped and ended up getting posted to places even worse than Taiwan. Between 1867 and 1874, there were a number of forgotten incidents that were quite high profile in their day. These seven years also gave off a whiff of the kind of events that were happening with some degree of regularity. Not just the Chinese on Taiwan, the native people too. They had their own kind of cruelty. They freely meted out on intruders into their perfect little world. Some of these stories bring to mind North Sentinel Island and the Andaman Islands. If you went ashore to that place, you did it at your own risk, and it's more than likely you'd get killed by the natives, or worse. In 1867 came the Rover incident of March 12th. Just like the others I mentioned, the Rover was just another merchant ship en route from Shanto to Yingko, a port on the... Liaodong Bay, halfway between Dalian and Shenyang. The American merchant vessel, the Rover, it ran aground off the southern tip of Taiwan, not far from where Kanding National Park is today. When the Paiwan native tribesmen got their hands on the crew of the Rover, 14 Americans were executed in retaliation for past gripes the native people had against one foreign nation or another. He's long forgotten, but in his day, the new American consul and shaman, Charles de Jonge, was quite an important figure in the American Foreign Service. Very interesting life, mostly spent in Asia. Well, he went straight to the Qing authorities in Fuzhou and demanded someone get to the bottom of this. In 1867, Taiwan was still part of Fujian province, so Fuzhou was the head office. And the officials there told Dijandre he was welcome to go look into this himself, and eh, they'd give him whatever support he required. Long story short, Dijandre set out from Shanghai in June 1867, arriving in Taiwan in September. Now, I myself have never hiked through the mountains of southern Taiwan with full gear in September. I heard it's pretty hot and humid, and probably much worse if... Indigenous people were taking constant pot shots at you from hidden locations. Anyway, this expedition led nowhere. Language, culture, misinformation, who knows what happened. Dejandre's men just wilted in the heat. Dejandre was able to meet with a Paiwan chieftain and came to an informal agreement that the native people would henceforth not harm any castaways. And in return, the chief asked that the Paiwan men who killed the American crew of the rover be let off the hook. It was more of the same in 1871. This time the victims were 54 sailors from the Ryukyu Islands, north of Taiwan. They suffered the misfortune of becoming shipwrecked. These were four tribute ships from Okinawa in the Ryukyus, 
Eh, same old story. Got blown off course due to a typhoon. In December 1871, one of the four vessels ended up grounded on the southeast coast of Taiwan. Sixty-four seamen from the Ryukyus made it to shore. They were promptly robbed by two Chinese, and then they headed inland. It was a bad idea. Started off good, though. They were accosted by the local Paiwan people of that area and taken back to their village, where the men from the Ryukyus were given succor. And from here on out, everything is speculation as far as the whys and what happened. The whole thing could have been chalked up to yet another cultural misunderstanding. For whatever reason, probably fearing for their lives, these 60-plus Okinawans, when their hosts were out hunting, made a quick run for it. They ran into some old Hakka guy who took them in. But the Paiwan people tracked these guys down and murdered 54 of them, beheaded them. A few got away and actually made it back to Naha, the capital of Okinawa. And there, in July 1782, these survivors told the authorities about their tragic tale. This was right around the time the Japanese toppled the final ruler of the Ryukyu kingdom that had been around since 1429, 61 years into the Ming dynasty. The Ryukyu kingdom always had a tributary relationship with Ming and later Qing China and recognized them as their suzerain. Now Japan, four years into the Meiji Restoration, started flexing right away and helped themselves to the Ryukyu Island chain, annexing them in 1872, folding the whole Ryukyu kingdom into the new Okinawa prefecture. China protested, but ultimately by March 1879, using foreign arbitration, the Ryukyu chain officially went to Japan. By this late in the dynasty, the Qing imperial court was rarely ever in a good bargaining position. Prior to that, though, Japan decided to rattle their sabers and demanded compensation for these 54 people killed on Taiwan in December 1871. June 1873, the Japanese foreign minister went to Beijing to protest. He even got to meet the Tongzhi Emperor. But his protestations were denied, and the minister was informed that the Ryukyus were a tributary of the Qing Empire, and they would handle this matter themselves. And besides, the Qing authorities declared the native people could not be civilized and were beyond their control. The Japanese government and military in the early years following the Meiji Restoration was filled with foreign advisors from all the great nations of the world. Two Americans served as advisors to the Japanese foreign minister, and these guys were spoiling for a fight. They told their Japanese employers if they wanted justice for these Ryukyu sailors murdered on Taiwan, they'd have to go get it themselves. After planning the whole expedition out, on May 6, 1874, a Japanese naval force led by one of these American advisors set out for southern Taiwan. We all know about the extent of Japan's militancy later on come the early 20th century. But here in 1874, this was the very first overseas outing for the Japanese imperial troops. Between May 6th and May 22nd, there were a number of very bloody skirmishes fought between the Japanese and these native fighters. The Japanese were not in their element. The native people had home field advantage and carried out a deadly guerrilla war with the Japanese. Then in July, a malaria outbreak killed 550 Japanese plus one of the American advisors. Finally, after everybody was bloodied and beaten from this conflict, the Qing Imperial Court agreed to pay the Japanese off in silver in order to get them to leave Taiwan. And after learning a few good lessons... The Japanese declared this punitive expedition a success and sailed back home. And this whole 1874 invasion was called the Mudan Incident, or Mudan Shu Shi Qian. During the 1870s, there had been some attempt made at organizing and building up Taiwan under the Viceroy of Liangjiang, Shen Baozhen, Liangjiang, it was comprised of the territories of Jiangsu, Anhui, and Jiangxi. 
Shun had been sent to Taiwan right after the Japanese left in 1874, and one of the projects begun by Shun Baozhen was intended to bust open the island more and integrate the Kaohsiung indigenous people into the mainstream and try to put an end to the centuries of violence between the Chinese settlers and these mountain dwellers. He had proposed three trails running east to west that went right through the center of the island, through the mountains. Well, this went ahead in January 1875, but you can guess how much the native people got on board with that. There were constant issues and fierce resistance. And this Batongguan Trail idea wouldn't be realized until the period of Japanese rule. This Japanese invasion of Taiwan, or Mudan incident, well, this isn't one of those big brand name events from Chinese history that everyone remembers, but it had a couple things worth noting. First off, it cemented Japanese control of the Ryukyus, which planted the seeds for today's contention over the Diaoyu, or Senkaku Islands. This whole mini-invasion of Taiwan by the Imperial Army of Japan was just an appetizer for the main meal that was to come later. It wasn't lost on the Japanese how weak the Qing forces were and how quick to settle the emperor was. They kept that in the back of their mind for future reference. They also took note of how vicious and violent the aboriginal people were and the aggressiveness of their attacks. These fierce and dangerous people would definitely need to be taken care of one day if Japan was ever to seize control of Taiwan. The French, too. They noted the events that had just happened in Taiwan, and this gave them the confidence to have their own little Taiwan adventure. This came in August 1884, when a French naval expedition sailed to China and Taiwan to teach the Qing government a lesson for double-crossing them in northern Vietnam. In the 1880s, France was intent on creating their little Indochine empire down in Vietnam and Cambodia. On and off since the Han Dynasty, Chinese forces had tried and failed to take over northern Vietnam, occupying the place for a time, but never permanently annexing it. Now France was having a go at it, and they wanted the Chinese out. The two competitors in northern Vietnam had just signed an agreement in Tianjin, ending the hostilities there. But that didn't stop Chinese forces from ambushing the French at Bac Lê, north of Hanoi, and inflicting terrible casualties. This was in June of that same year, 1884. So for this double cross in Vietnam, the French were wasting no time in extracting their pound of flesh from the Chinese. When news reached Paris about what had happened at Bac Lê, Voices in the government called for retribution. Cooler heads did not prevail, and on August 2, 1884, a small French flotilla sailed to Geelong to give the Chinese a black eye and blow up their defenses and rattle the 5,000 Chinese troops defending northern Taiwan. This is where Liu Ming Chuan enters our story. He had just been appointed as Imperial Commissioner of Taiwan. And he'll be managing affairs during this period of contention with the French on Taiwan, mostly in and around Geelong. So August 4th, the French arrived and demanded the Chinese surrender these defensive positions. They had three fortifications or batteries that overlooked the harbor. Of course, there was no capitulation, so things progressed to the next step. The French ships let loose on these coastal batteries in Geelong and destroyed them all. They also tried to land some troops on the beach, but this attempt was repelled by Chinese forces led by Liu Mingchuan. This wasn't proving to be so easy. The French officers learned from this first outing, sailed away, and regrouped. Then, not long after, on August 23, 1884, The French blew the Fujian naval fleet to smithereens at the Battle of Fuzhou, and with this act, the Sino-French War was off and running. This conflict would run for 16 months, ending in April 1885. Feeling more confident after this one-sided victory over the Chinese, the French decided to make one more go at taking Geelong and turning it into a major resupply base. The head office back in Paris... Green lighted the whole idea, and an expeditionary force was assembled. 
It mostly consisted of veteran French troops with plenty of experience gained in Vietnam, or Tonkin, as it was referred to. 1880s, France was just commencing its whole Indochine enterprise. They had plenty of soldiers in the region already, and they arrived in Geelong on October 1st. They also made an attempt to take Danshui, but were repulsed. The fighting between Chinese and French troops in Geelong started on November 2nd. We're still in 1884. Liu Mingchuan had been going all out to prepare for the inevitable return of the French and had been building fortifications and reinforcing the Qing positions. Nonetheless, despite a valiant effort, the French were able to push the Chinese out of Jilong and proceeded to occupy the city. And that's as far as they were able to get in this campaign. They occupied Jilong, but spent most of the time hunkered down in a long stalemate situation. By April 1885, the Qing military, led by Liu Mingchuan, was fully reinforced, resupplied, locked and loaded, and itching to attack the French in Jilong. As for the French hold up there, hundreds and hundreds of the troops had been stricken with cholera and other maladies. And after a few brilliant victories at the start of the campaign, the French seemed invincible. But disease and a re-energized Chinese fighting force had taken all the wind out of the French sails. Liu Mingchuan had also enlisted a local Hakka militia to fight alongside Qing troops against the French. He tried to enlist the help of the local natives in the area, but those fighters were bringing knives to a gunfight and not much help. By the 1880s, the Hakkas were very well represented on the island of Taiwan and Penghu. At the conclusion of the Taiping Rebellion, mid-1860s, a lot of Hakkas, escaping the backlash for starting the whole thing, closed up shop on the mainland and sailed to Taiwan to begin anew. Despite their comparative military disadvantages, the French forces were putting up a heck of a fight. They, too, managed to freshen up and replace their decimated troops. French forces... They scored a number of victories over Liu Mingchuan's troops, forcing them to leave their strategic positions outside Jilong. The French had even sailed to Penghu to evict the Chinese from their naval supply base there. So in March and April of 1885, Liu Mingchuan was licking his wounds and planning his next moves to kick the French forces out of Taiwan and Penghu. The French were digging in and definitely fixing to stay a while. But then suddenly, on April 4th, 1885, just as peace had been agreed to in the Sino-French War, the French command in Penghu received an urgent order to hightail it back to Tonkin, again Vietnam, where the French had just suffered another military setback. The French didn't evacuate Taiwan until June 22nd, 1885, just after the last of the Chinese forces had left northern Vietnam as part of the agreement. This so-called Qilong campaign of August 1884 to April 1885 was watched very closely by the Japanese. They picked up a few pointers from the French that would come in handy later on when their turn came. Today in Qilong, you could go visit the graves of some of the fallen French soldiers at the Sino-French War Memorial Park. So let's look at Liu Mingchuan. He's not an A-lister in Chinese history, that's for sure. In Taiwan history, though, he's pretty important. He was the right person at the right time, who was able to take Qing control of the island to the next level. He's remembered as the greatest reformer during the island's brief period under Qing rule. He was born in the Anhui capital of Hefei in 1836 and basically grew up and lived his life during the Treaty Port era. He was the perfect fighting age around the time the Taiping Rebellion was raging in China. As soon as he was old enough, Liu Mingchuan got his start fighting for Zhang Guofan and Li Hongzhang. In 1861, he had been leading a small local militia group fighting the rebels. And that's when opportunity knocked on his door and he threw his lot in with Li Hongzhang's Huai army. He also fought with Charles Gordon during the Taiping Rebellion. He went on to serve the Qing military brilliantly and began to rise up the ranks. Poor health had sidelined Liu Mingchuan, and he retired from public office until 1884, 
when the emperor called on him to deal with the French, another would-be colonizer of Taiwan. After this whole Jilong campaign, the Qing imperial court finally knew the wisdom of what Shirlong had been explaining to the Kangxi emperor about Taiwan's strategic importance to China's coastal security. And finally, after all these traumas during the 1870s and 80s, the government in Beijing began to take more notice of Taiwan. And now, with the capable and successful Liu Mingchuan in charge, the time had come to start taking Taiwan more seriously. One of the first things Liu Mingchuan did was to help champion the idea of turning Taiwan into its own province. Since the defeat of the Jungs in 1683, Taiwan had been a prefecture under Fujian. Now, in 1887, Taiwan was made a province in its own right, called Fujian Taiwan Province. When Liu Mingchuan began his reforms, he built on top of what had already been started by Shen Baozhen. As Liu Mingchuan was trying to do great things on this new island province, support from the center was once again not enthusiastic. Lacking this strong support from the capital, Liu Mingchuan's political enemies and all the vested interests in Taiwan, they tried to dog him in carrying out many of these reforms. Despite Shirlong's convincing argument to Kangxi regarding Taiwan's importance, over the past 200 years that Taiwan had belonged to China, the Qing rulers didn't do much of anything except keep shooing away foreigners who had grand designs on the place. The short list of everything Liu Mingchuan was able to get done during his time in office as Taiwan's first governor was quite impressive. The new province got its first taste of infrastructure a national transport network, a tax system, improvements in agriculture, irrigation, a financial system, education, a telegraph service that linked Danshui and Fuzhou, a modern postal system was implemented, built on the model used on the mainland. He also had the first railway built on Taiwan. It only went from Taipei to Jilong, but you have to start somewhere. In the new cities, Buildings were constructed that were the landmarks of their day. In 1887, he had electric street lamps installed in Taipei. It was too expensive to operate, but he did get it all wired up. And the coal potential of northern Taiwan was also exploited. There were a lot of hits and misses, as it is for any reformer trying to do too much in the face of so much resistance and opposition. Besides the lack of support he got for all his big plans, Liu Mingchuan also he wasn't able to get Qing's support for his main objective, which was to upgrade the military installations around the island. So Liu Mingchuan is remembered as the first governor of Taiwan after it was made a province in 1887. He's also remembered as the first Qing official to try and make something of the place beyond taking advantage of the developed coastal areas in the southwest and north. Ultimately, and this contributes to his obscurity in Chinese history, once he retired, again for health reasons, in 1891, no one picked up the ball and carried it forward. And most of these reforms Liu Mingchuan tried to launch stalled and went nowhere. He retired to his hometown of Hefei in Anhui and lived just barely long enough to see Taiwan fall into Japanese hands. And hearkening back to Yue Fei in the 12th century, shouting at the Jurchens to Huan Wo He Shan, return my rivers and mountains, meaning North China. Well, legend goes, as soon as Liu Mingchuan heard that Taiwan had been ceded to Japan as Part of the terms of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, he got up from his sickbed, faced east, and cried out, Tsang Tian, Huang Wo de Taiwan. Oh heaven, give me back my Taiwan. Yeah, April 17th, 1895, a date that will live in infamy, the signing of the Treaty of Shimonoseki. Liu Mingchuan died January 21st, the following year. Heartbroken to see how it all turned out. Surely it wasn't lost on him that Japan, more than anyone else, was the ultimate beneficiary of his sincere reform efforts in Taiwan. Next episode, 
We'll see what happens on Taiwan beginning in 1895. Also for next time, and I haven't gotten to this yet, but following the Opium Wars and into the Treaty Port era, trade with Taiwan really exploded. I mentioned there were already four treaty ports open to trade. And come 1855, someone is going to transplant cuttings from the Wu Yi Mountains in northern Fujian and plant them in Luku Township in the center of Taiwan, Nanto County, bringing forth Dongding Tea into this world. Although this was covered in more detail in the Tea History podcast, Next time I'll mention about Li Chunsheng and John Dodd and how they turned Formosa Oolong Tea into a household name all over the world. We'll take a look at how Taiwan's tea industry got started and how it took the world by storm. So, do please come back for more. We're getting into the Japanese occupation years, 1895 to 1945. Quite a bit to get to. As we get closer to the 20th century, more of these events are fresher in our mind. Some of us were even alive when a lot of this happened. The Japanese occupation of Taiwan and its merits and blemishes is still a contentious issue, one of many. Thanks for listening, mes beaux auditeurs. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Alhambra, California. Please think about coming back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.